When people ask me about Drupal, it happens all the time. I'm trying to explain uh, to people what it is that I do. Uh, it's a little hard once you answer the question, oh, I build websites, and then, then usually that's enough for some people and they don't want to hear anymore. Uh, and then a lot of people, they wonder, well, what's, what's special about what you do and, and what's this Drupal thing? Drupal is a lot of things to a lot of people. At the simplest level, it's um, a piece of software that allows someone to easily manage the content of their website, like all of the blog posts or the news stories or something like that. And it allows you to edit the content through a web browser rather than having to pay somebody who knows a lot of HTML and how to do fancy code things to actually change things for you. In a traditional sense, usually with web pages, you have to you know, edit some code by hand and you have to you know, ma manage these files everywhere and links and stuff like that. Um, Drupal makes that a lot easier. Once you get it installed, you can just click buttons to add pages and forms and all this kind of stuff. You can go to a, a page, click an edit button, and all the content that was on that page is now in a series of forms, in a series of text fields. So you can go there, you can edit it, save it, and then you, you're editing the content in real time on your site. So whether it's a, you know, a social networking site uh, that has you know, lots of user interaction or my single user blog, making sure that you know, the code that runs it all as well as the administration interface uh, works in all those different scenarios. A lot of people refer to Drupal as a, as a content management system, a CMS. So how I describe a content management system, first it's good to give a little bit of historical perspective on the way things have been. The explosive growth in the number of people who have discovered the power of the internet for learning, marketing, and just plain having fun has been incredible. The internet is changing the way we learn, work, and play forever. So when the web first came into existence, the way people created web pages was each page on a website was its own page. Web pages used to be just a collection of little small files called HTML files, and they just have code in them. You would use a program like Microsoft Front Page or Dreamweaver, or you would roll your own, and you'd write, you'd code out every single page on your site, which is good and fine, except if you're Amazon.com, you're going to have a million pages, two million pages. The number of just files that were lying around was just astronomical and keeping them in sync and making design changes was almost impossible to pull off without huge amounts of work. Um, that's how the concept of dynamic websites really took off. They wanted a way to say, hey, you know this copyright's going to be on every page? Let's put that in one place and then link to that within all of our other pages so that when we need to change the copyright, we do it in one place and it spiders out through the rest of the site. It's designed to, to be able to run on the lowest common denominator hardware. It runs on the LAMP platform, which is Linux, Apache, MySQL, 
PHP. Where Drupal fits in with that is uh, you basically have Linux on the bottom layer and that's running your operating system. That kind of is keeping like your disk drives running really low level stuff like that. Then you have Apache sitting on top of that. What that is is a web server. It handles it when you go to www.example.com it will go and find a file on the, on the computer it's installed on and then feed it back to you through your web browser. MySQL is a database, so that's storing all the content of your website as well as all your users, all of your um, sales reports, things like that all go into a database. And then PHP is kind of the bridge between uh, MySQL and Apache to sort of take this dynamic content out of the database and present it in such a way that someone can view it in you know, Internet Explorer, Firefox, and that kind of thing. Drupal basically serves as an underlayer to, to generate HTML, but how it does it is instead of having uh, hundreds or thousands, even millions of HTML pages that are all individually written, uh, Drupal is very centralized in, in how it generates pages. A database-driven system uh, works off the concept of all of your content being centralized in one place and it's fed dynamically through template files and such to just output uh, you know, whatever the content of the page is at any given time. So instead of having, say, 200 pages, you probably have about one or two, um, and then there's little dynamic bits called variables that just feed in, like, say, the content of a given page or the title of a given page. The part I think that most Drupal developers get really excited about is the underlying framework of Drupal. The other thing that it is, is it's a content management framework. And what that means is that it allows you uh, to hire a developer, or if you're a developer yourself, to extend Drupal to do additional functionality beyond what it normally can do. I've really, really grown to appreciate Drupal's capabilities as a platform to build additional solutions on top of because of its APIs and all of its hooks for additional third-party plugin modules to be built on top of it. I've found that if there is a feature that Drupal doesn't have, the distance between starting with Drupal and adding that feature is much shorter than me trying to go and build something from scratch on my own. Certainly for developers, uh, the flexibility is kind of the, the key that, that I find. It's, it's what helped me fall in love with it. The fact that uh, it's got a very kind of clean, simple core uh, with lots of hooks exposed that can be used to, to add in you know, any kind of functionality that you want. Without having to actually like dig in and, and actually even understanding code, you can do a lot and really create exactly what you want by snapping the proper pieces together. The idea of taking all of these small Lego brick pieces and assembling them together into large sites with a lot of rich functionality is really, really important for the direction that Drupal has been growing in. So the idea that you, you work with a, a kind of a base platform and then you're, you're clicking pieces together uh, and that's typically, you know, the, at least the first portion of a Drupal install or Drupal site build uh, is that you're, you're clicking a bunch of these pieces together uh, and tying them together. So not only can you get to, to pick and pull pieces out for free and try them out uh, by installing them on your site and actually seeing how well they work, you can also open them up and look at them on the inside and see exactly how well they're written, um, how good the code quality is, and, and find out if it's a quality enough piece of software that you want to use uh, as the basis for your website. What attracted me to Drupal was the code, the elegance of the code. It was, it was commented, it was clean, uh, it, uh, it had a really elegant arch architecture to it. And when I started looking at Drupal's code, it was like, Amazing. I mean, it was like this I could understand and there were all, all this, you know, just a lot of stuff that, that really made me feel like the software was much smarter than me. There really was a lot of stuff underneath um, and I just needed to sort of learn how to harness it and that I would be able to do anything that we needed to do for this site. We already have, you know, a flexible content system. We already have a taxonomy system. This is stuff that you don't have to develop yourself and instead you can build on top of stuff that just comes for taking for granted from, uh, from Drupal, and you can start doing stuff that really matters to your actual project.
Drupal being open source was very important um, simply because I was looking for a way to get a head start on something by taking something existing and then uh, working up from a point where um, I started really high up and then uh, just could work higher from there. Over the last several years, Drupal has really evolved a lot and it's grown from you know, just a prepackaged website that you can turn features on and off into a real platform for building really, really advanced, large-scale websites. A lot of larger companies are starting to take interest um, because a lot of them are coming either from a vendor who they you know, pay hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in order to maintain their content management system, or something custom where they have to maintain a fleet of developers in order to just keep it running and maintained. Um, open source is a very appealing option to them because it allows them to leverage this community of literally thousands of people um, that are not on their payroll that can do things like adding new features, testing for bugs, um, and just making little improvements here and there. Closed software is like buying a car with the hood welded shut. So if you want to change the oil or see what's going on underneath, you really don't have a way to do that. You know, you're dependent on taking it to another person. You're depending on them giving you the features of the car that, you know, that you are left with. And open source software is like, sometimes you're lucky if you get a hood, <laughs> but you, you are able to get in there and, and dig around and see how things work, change your own oil. And uh, that's really liberating for a lot of companies. And by being free and open source, as developers, it makes it very, very easy to get a, a much richer, much deeper understanding of the code, how it works, and how best to, to use it and extend it. The fact that it is free, um, as in beer, um, and also free as in freedom, in that um, you, can, you can change things on your own and that you're not locked in to what somebody else has given you and, and you you're sort of basically at, at their whim. By, by being licensed GPL, uh, you know, Drupal kind of not only secures the, the code uh, at its core to kind of live on as free and open source software, but it also uh, promotes uh, and in some cases dictates that the code that has been added onto it and extensions, so downloadable modules, are also GPL licensed and therefore freely available. Another feature of it is, uh, and why people might choose it, um, is, is just the development community around it and the contributor community. It's uh, basically, it has a huge developer base of thousands of people constantly improving the software and, and the uh, add-ons available. The growth has been kind of staggering uh, and, you know, to the point where it's, it's really kind of shocking to, to actually sit and think about the, you know, the community as well as the software itself. It's just sort of this uh, self-feeding thing where Drupal gets better, it get more people get interested because it's better, and then we have more people who are working on it so it gets better, and then more people get interested in it again. And so it's just uh, it's a fascinating process to watch and be a part of. So there's a lot of jargon in Drupal, and it really increases the you know, what's referred to as the I suck threshold of, you know, there's taxonomy and node and all of these, all of this sort of jargon that you have to learn. And it takes a while to, to, to absorb that and soak it in and get over that place where you start to feel confident that you can talk the talk. Yeah, nodes was uh, probably one of the hardest concepts for me to get when I first got to Drupal. I remember just sort of being puzzled by the word and sort of I don't know, I just want to make pages, okay? I just want web pages. I don't know what this node stuff is and ah. Uh, the idea of nodes of content can be a little confusing to people, usually because uh, they say things like, well, why not just call it a post? Or why not just call it a story or an article or something like that? Um, the difficulty is that a node could be any or all of those things. A node is the basic building block of, of Drupal. Drupal is a content management system, and a node is the content. 
uh, that is being managed. Yeah, so if you've worked with Drupal for any given time, you've probably noticed that when you look at a piece of content like a blog entry or a poll, you'll see this weird node slash one thing. Drupal picked the word node for some reason uh, to refer to any piece of content in the system. And so for me, learning what a node was, no matter how many descriptions I read or how many people tried to explain it to me, I had to just use Drupal <laughs> to actually understand it. Um, but really, it is essentially, I mean, it's just a piece of content on the site. What a piece of content means is, is does it have a title and an author and a description or body? Um, does it have a create date? Things like that. Uh, most importantly, they have a unique ID uh, so they can be addressed you know, via URL or referenced uniquely uh, throughout the system. They basically stepped back at one point and said, okay, well, we have polls and we have stories and we have pages and we have articles and we have, you know, events, all kinds of stuff. And they said, what are the main things that are common between these different, uh, different elements? And so they drew out those individual pieces like the titles and such, and then put those into sort of a concept of an overarching content piece called a node, and then everything else just adds stuff to a basic node. Um, another huge advantage of the, the node system and being centralized and such is that uh, Drupal can track revisions to nodes, which means that if you edit um, a piece of content and change a couple lines and hit save, it can store a revision of that so that you can go back and uh, revert back to the way it was before. If you want to, you don't have to keep a copy of every single change that you make, but you can and what will happen is every time you make a change, if you tell there's a, a checkbox for make a revision um, and what will happen is Drupal will basically take a snapshot of that data and put that into the database um, every time you make a change. This is particularly important for things like managing abuse. Um, it's also important for things like, say you're running your entire user manual for your you know, employee handbook or something off of Drupal, you want to be able to see how that document's evolved over time. Um, and so Drupal will keep track of all that for you, and you can revert revisions, you can delete revisions, you can add new revisions, and it's, it's just a way of protecting your content and kind of keeping a content backup of everything. Generally speaking, on the end user side, uh, the visitors should never really see the word node. Throughout uh, the user interface, the guidelines for, for writing um, Drupal modules is that you don't talk about nodes. The first rule of nodes is you don't talk about nodes. <laughs> and, uh... Oftentimes, where you hear the word node is in the developer speak. Uh, you hear it less sort of on the end user side of things. Uh, in, the, in the Drupal administra administrative interface, it's called a content type. But the truth is that all the developers refer to these things as nodes. So one of the things that Drupal can do with this content management component is it can allow you to create different types of content. The way Drupal works is it uses this concept of content types, and it's really, it's really incredible, and I think one of Drupal's strengths. Um, Drupal allows you to divide up the content on your site into different kinds of content, so that each different type of content, like events or blog posts or uploaded photos, can be treated differently. Different node types can have different attributes, they can have different um, default settings of whether they're promoted to the home page or not, whether they show um, the user submission information, the date it was posted and stuff like that. I can make those look different, I can list them in different ways, um, and so I can group them together, I can you know split them apart um, and, and sort of rearrange how I want my my data, my content to to be displayed on the site. And you can also set different permissions on content types as well. Any content type in the system, you can control who can create it, who can edit it, who can delete it, who can manage all of those things, um, and, and even who can manage all content across the site altogether.
When I started building WordPress blogs, um, the thing that I was always missing was the ability to add more fields. I wanted more than just this, the title and the excerpt synopsis or whatever they, they, they call it, and different things on different um, uh, web applications, and, and the body. It starts out with just the title and the body as a basic node. Uh, and then you take those two basic pieces and then you start adding additional things onto them, like adding in taxonomy information and publishing information uh, and using CCK, adding in additional fields um, that make it so you can tack on all kinds of additional information around the basic node. So CCK uh, is the content construction kit uh, and really is about creating custom content types. So, you know, moving beyond uh, blog posts and simple stories that have title and body and adding extra additional fields of information. With CCK, that sort of that, that holy grail of being able to add as many fields as you want um, to the content type is starting to be realized in Drupal. I mean, this is really, really powerful stuff. And fields can be anything from text fields to image fields to number fields to date fields. There's even some really fancy modules out there that let you do like attach embedded videos or uh, you know complete addresses and, and all kinds of stuff. The flexibility that you get from that is really amazing. It's like you don't get this sort of just block of content and you're just stuck with this this monolithic block and you have to use it the way that it is and it's always going to be this way you know and they're all the same and you can't distinguish between anything it's like no you know different types of content have different meaning to me on my site and I want them to be I want to be able to do different things with them you don't want to have just one form on your entire site for all of the content uh, instead uh, building out different content types allows you to basically sp build specialized forms uh, for whatever kind of content you're actually talking about. Basically creating, especially when you have other people who are going to be creating content um, on your site, giving them a, a form to fill out that has the exact fields that are descriptive of what the information is you want to elicit from them is hugely helpful in getting the right information. Uh, so CCK really allows you to completely through the interface just add those additional fields and configure them, uh, add default values and things like that to really make uh, the data entry or the, the content creation on the site very simple and streamlined. Now from a developer's perspective, this is great because this sort of stuff we do day in and day out and it gets old and tedious to do those sort of same things over and over again when you're just playing with the same type of code. So if we can hand that control off to you know, an administrator, a site editor, so that they can go in and set up these systems, that gives us time to do the fun things. Building out separate content types is basically uh, the first building block of your website, the first step to actually getting a new site underway. Uh, boot up Drupal, uh, install CCK, start building your, your content types that all contain uh, the various fields that you need to describe those pieces of content. For a long time, um, the history of the web was very much one of small teams of people going and building a website and putting it up for other people to come and view. Um, it was, although it was a lot more flexible and a lot easier than older publishing models before the web was available, it still meant that it was one team of people making things and another consuming things. Drupal is part of uh, a trend in the evolution of the internet towards the people who come to a website and who visit it actually helping build and develop the content for it. A lot of companies have started looking at Drupal seriously as a content management system because they're really interested in sort of playing catch up to all of the the sites that are around now where users interact with the site. It's no longer an informational site where you just go there and there's information and you click around and that's it. Uh, now uh, a lot of big corporations are really interested in interactive sites. The idea is that it's not just my team publishing and that, team and that group of people reading, but um, my team 
building an environment where other people can come in and share what they're interested in or what their thoughts on something is. A visitor to the website is called a user in Drupal speak. Um, and there are two types of users at a base level. There's anonymous users which haven't logged in yet and there's authenticated users who have. The first and simplest is an anonymous user. Um, that means just somebody who's coming and is asking to see a given page on the website but has never logged in and Drupal has no real way of identifying who that person is. Basically you have an anonymous user who just anybody just wandering around on the web they randomly, oh, looky, here's a site. Um, and what they're going to see um, could be drastically different from someone uh, that's created an account on your site and that you, so therefore you know and you want to give them something different to see. I mean, a lot of social networking sites, you have to log in in order to act, actually get that functionality. A similar concept in Drupal is what's called the authenticated user. That just means someone who comes to the site and has created a user account and given some sort of identifying information so that Drupal can know, oh, this is Bob or this is Mary and they're interested in this particular kind of topic. I should show them that on the front page. And it goes through and basically has to check and build and say for this particular person at this particular time, I need to build XYZ page for them and then display that for them when it gets to the end. And uh, you know, it, it could it can involve all kinds of things like do they even have access to the page? Because <laughs> if they don't, I'm not gonna show it to them. I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna redirect them to, you know, a busy signal <laughs> that, you know, this you, you're not allowed to access this page. Or it might be, well, they they are allowed to see the page, but it's going to be, I'm going to display it to them in a slightly different way. It could be at some point something as simple in terms of theme layers like a color, but it could also be actually in the amount of data that's displayed. You don't necessarily get all of it. Blogs and blogging software, which tends to be one person running their own site, where there's that level of trust of everyone who has the permission to post things on the web using this site, um, is usually, you know, is either one person or a small group of people who all know each other. With Drupal, it's kind of anyone can come and register for the site, um, and then you need to decide what you're actually going to be able to trust them to do. And that's still one of Drupal's strengths is how well it works as a community tool and it's not limited to just one person on the site you know a static sort of site it's it's um, different roles different permissions Drupal at its at its heart uses a, a role-based permission system uh, and and a very flexible one at that so you can as a site administrator you can define any number of roles that a user may have within your system and any role that, that that user has will then dictate what permissions and what things that user is allowed to do within the site, uh, which allows for, for varying levels of interaction. In addition to that, you can define additional roles such as like a manager role or an administrator role or a lawyer role or something, and they can have additional privileges above and beyond what authenticated users have. Usually when we create a Drupal site, the first thing we'll do is create a new role for administrator and we'll usually call it admin and basically go through and check off all of the boxes so that anyone in the admin role um, has all those permissions. You don't need to have one uh, user account that everyone in the company has the password for that's the root user account that has all the permissions uh, and then somebody goes and leaves the company and they decide to deface the site and stuff like that. It's no fun. So instead, you can, uh, you can set up this admin role and people have their own username and their own password and, uh, and they have all the permissions for everything, basically. As more and more people are contributing and interacting, you know, more and more users are logging into your site, uh, you can clearly define and cleanly define uh, what each of those users is allowed to do within your site. So whether it's creating different types of content, uh, or you have users that are allowed to publish things or, or promote things, that all can be cleanly separated out using this, the role-based permission system.
I'd say one of the, the great strengths of Drupal um, and one of the reasons why a lot of people get involved in it is because uh, it has the, the flexibility to do so many things and behind all of that now is just a, a single user login system. And this is one of the really powerful things about it. I mean, uh, if you're writing your own content management system, you have to handle all of this yourself. But with Drupal, Drupal automatically just knows a bunch of information about the user. Drupal um, does all the heavy lifting work of maintaining contextual information about um, who a user is, what they've been doing. You can do things like keep track of what pieces of content they've written versus what pieces of content other people have written when their last visit was, things like that. All of the process of keeping track of who the user is that's logged in and what permissions they have and sort of what else is going on in the site is all handled by Drupal's framework. The user login system is, is part of core and then everything else gets put on top of that. Uh, it's, it's a very central piece and something that not a lot of systems have. This great luxury of uh, every single module, everything that's built on top of Drupal has the convenience of knowing who the current logged in user is, uh, what their credentials are, information about them. Blocks are another one of those pieces of Drupal jargon that you've probably heard but not known what they are. The, the good news is, is that if you've built a Drupal site, you've interacted with a block before, knowingly or not knowingly. The user login form is a block. It shows up on the sidebar. Drupal calls these blocks, um, kind of a nondescript name, but it, it's what they're called. They're little blocks that can appear across the site. And what blocks are and how they're different from nodes is nodes are the main content and blocks are the accessory information, the additional information usually shown in the sidebars. The navigation system, the, a little search form maybe, a block. So basically there are, there are kind of two ways that content's represented in Drupal. Nodes is the big one. That's for sort of like content pieces that you generally are gonna write once and then leave alone. Um, you know, you might go back and make minor edits, but in general, once you've written your About Us page, it's written and it's done. Blocks are uh, another way. They are generally more for dynamic, up-to-the-minute content. So for example, Drupal ships with some blocks like who's online and uh, recent comments and things like that that are gonna change a lot over time. Other examples of, of blocks would be recent comments, recent forum topics, all that sort of accessory information that you would see that goes along the main content area of your site. You might want to have, uh, as we do on lullabot.com, show the latest posts on the site. The, what's the latest article on the site? What's our latest podcast? Uh, and have a link to that that goes across all the pages. It might be ad banners. Uh, it might be um, just stuff that, that tends to appear on multiple pages on the site. And the other thing that blocks are for is kind of supplementary information to the current content. For example, there's an author information block that you can enable, which if you look at any post by a given person, it will bring up just more details about their user profile and stuff like that. Um, you can also put, you know, actual content in a block. Sometimes people will use blocks for things like a, you know, sale of the week kind of thing. But in general, I, I like to make the distinction where like a node is sort of permanent content that you want to be searchable and, and things like that. Um, and a block is more either transient content that changes constantly, or it's just like supplementary information to sort of enhance the, the rest of the content on the page. At the heart of Drupal uh, and all of its functionality is the concept of modules. And what a module is, is, is essentially it's just a little piece of code. Modules are Drupal's plugins. They add functionality. A lot of the Drupal system is built around this idea of modules, um, plug-in software that can either change the default behavior of a given feature in Drupal or add new features entirely. If you want to add a new feature or a new function to your site, um, you would use a module to do that. And examples of modules are things like the blog module, which lets you post blog entries.
All of these things that we're talking about, modules basically have the ability to sort of fundamentally add and or modify uh, what, what Drupal does. Um, and it makes it really powerful. A given module can add new features or change behaviors without any of the other modules on the Drupal site knowing what's, what's happening or even being aware of that. This idea of all of these different pieces that weren't written explicitly to work with each other but can be combined and using Drupal's APIs they can all interact effectively without clobbering each other. That's one of the really effective and powerful aspects of the software. Core, which is what we refer to the Drupal that you download by default, uh, comes with a handful of modules. Most of them are pretty simple. And then there's a couple of like sort of utility modules that you kind of have to have, like system and filter, uh, that take care of very low-level tasks. You know, Drupal kind of provide, uh, prides itself on having a very small core library that it uses, uh, and it always wants to make sure that core library is as efficient uh, as possible. Uh, Drupal comes with very little functionality right out of the box. Uh, instead, what it's meant to be is a system where you start out with something small that does basically what every website needs to do. And then by enabling modules, uh, you add additional functionality onto the website. You know, the community has gone to great lengths to make Drupal a tight, lean, secure machine. And the philosophy is to, to keep things as efficient uh, and effective as possible uh, and as light as possible. That's where the flexibility of Drupal lies, is that it's really small and compact when you start out. Uh, but then by just enabling whatever modules you feel are necessary, um, the site can get a whole lot of functionality really fast. Drupal operates off the concept of this crazy thing called the hook system. The hook system is something that, that makes Drupal really extensible and it's something that is, is really, really simple just at its core, but adds so much flexibility to Drupal that it, it really gets developers in and working with Drupal in a really short amount of time. You can think of Drupal as, a, as an event-driven system. All along the process of spitting out a Drupal page, there's different moments along the way where it says, does anybody need to do anything here? The module that's responsible for rendering the page will stop occasionally and, and ask uh, all the other modules in Drupal, all right, I'm at this point with processing the data. Is anybody else interested in changing the data? And other modules will all get a shot at changing uh, whatever data is currently being processed. And that might be loading some additional things from the database and adding it to the node object. All along the way, there's these things called hooks, which basically means that a module developer can hook into it and say, okay, I want to do something at this point, and Drupal will pass along the context. It'll say, okay, here's the, the user that's logged in, here's the content that they're wanting to view, and now I, as the module developer, can change that up, manipulate it, do whatever I want. One example is when you view the, the user permissions screen and you get a big list of checkboxes of all the different permissions in the site. Uh, it, what it's doing there is it's, it's querying all of the installed modules in the system and asking if any of them would like to define permissions. Anytime I've gone to add in a new bit of functionality, uh, all of the, the kind of hooks to, to add my extra code were already there and available for me uh, and easy to integrate with. And so that, that's where Drupal gets a lot of its flexibility. It's not just the node module that, that has this ability. Every module in Drupal uh, can at any point decide to ask other modules what they want to do with uh, what data is currently being processed and have a chance to change it. So the difference between core and contrib uh, is, is manifested in that they're actually two different code repositories. 
uh, which sort of serves as a metaphor for how those code repositories are treated. So the core of Drupal is what you download when you download the, you know, the zip file of Drupal from Drupal.org. And it's sort of the base uh, libraries and things that Drupal needs to get started, as well as a collection of, of around 30 modules that are kind of common features that most sites will use. In addition to those, there's also the contributed modules, which is the rich uh, community supplied modules. Uh, and those can do all kinds of crazy things like event management, uh, photo galleries, you know, neat little JavaScript, clicky, draggy, shiny, pretty things, uh, all that kind of stuff. Drupal is moving towards a world where there's lots of small pieces, modules and add-ons that do one or two things really, really well, but a website is built by combining lots of those things together. The fact that things like CCK and views uh, and, and image handling things are all in contrib means that, that you know, almost every Drupal site and Drupal implementation requires both pieces. Uh, so the, the contrib modules aren't just optional add-ons, they tend to be very core pieces uh, that, that Drupal requires. The number of additional add-ons for Drupal, um, plug-in modules that are available, has exploded um, over the past couple of years. We've gone from having a good solid 700 modules to thousands that are now available um, for a huge variety of different, you know, functions. The Drupal Contrib repository, the contributions are add-on modules, uh, and it's much more the wild west of Drupal code. Uh, it's much easier to get access to maintain modules there, uh, and the maintainership is, you know, the level of maintainership depends on the individual who's doing the maintaining. On a basic level, the menu system is a way to create a navigational system for your site. The menu system allows you to manage all of the navigation links that are available for users who are surfing around the site and clicking around and trying to decide what's even available when they're looking around. When you install a Drupal site and you log in as an administrator, and there's all those links that you can click on, you know, the create content, the administer site, that's implemented as, as a menu, as a Drupal menu. There's one menu, the basic navigation menu, that Drupal automatically builds for you and will maintain. Um, as you install third-party modules, they can add new menu items to that without any other interaction. So it's a way to navigate your site and it knows about things like parent and child relationships so you can have links that are children of other links and that sort of stuff. So if you want to have some sort of hierarchical navigation system, you would definitely use a menu for that. But again, by default, Drupal has this concept of, uh, of the primary links and primary navigation. Um, and then it also has secondary links so you could um, you know, when you go to one section of the site, you might have further links that help you get there. So if you have an about page or something like that, you need to put that somewhere so that someone can actually find it. Um, and so you would add that to a menu in Drupal, and then it would appear on all of the pages. It's really important to keep in mind that there's a very small amount of information that um, the Drupal software or any web platform has to go on. Um, all that's really there is the URL that a user has asked for, and if they've logged into the website, there's going to be um, a cookie storing uh, session information, that just a unique identifier for that person. As far as what's coming in from their browser, that's all you have to go on. A big thing when I got out started in Drupal was I couldn't figure out, okay, um, I just have this path and I want to make something appear at this path. Um, in traditional development, what that means is you make a series of folders and then you put a file in where you want um, to take over that path. When you see a path like user slash one, you might think that under the hood of things there's a user directory and then there's files for user one, user two, user three, and so on. 
But in actuality, all of the requests that you make to Drupal.org run through a file called index.php. Because in Drupal, there's actually only one PHP file that's called for every single request. There is no about.php and news.php. There's exactly one file and it's index.php. And that file is called on every single request. Uh, and the very first thing that's fired up is uh, the menu system. The fact that it is a dynamic site and that your pages are, are built dynamically on the fly um, is a much more complex process than people would realize just on the surface when you're used to just plain HTML. The menu system is a lot more than just menus. It, it's not just uh, what you see like along the top of the page or along in the sidebar. Uh, rather, in, in Drupal, the menu system is actually uh, it's actually what defines what gets executed on the entire page. It's like uh, a page router. Underneath the hood, the menu system keeps track of every single valid URL path on your website. It's sort of the switchboard operator of Drupal, um, taking an incoming URL and determining what module and what PHP function should be responsible for actually building the content at that URL. One of Drupal's innovations early on has been the clean URL system. And what we did is we said, look, these URLs that most dynamic content management systems generate tend to have a lot of gobbledygook in them and tend to make them hard to read for humans, hard to remember, right? If your URL has a bunch of question marks and ampersands and tildes and you know all that other stuff, I mean, you can't even it's hard to remember it, let alone say that to another person. Just go to index.php, question mark, black slash, you know, squiggly line. So what we did is we came up with a way to hide all of that stuff, to sort of make it not visible, but still work, if you will. And so we did that through using clean URLs, uh, where, you know, instead of pages being index.php, question mark, q equals node slash 11, it's just node slash 11. The pages are being built dynamically. The, the beginning part, your example.com part of your URL, saying, you know, that's the website that I'm on. But everything after that is, is a query because that's how Drupal is actually building that page is you're actually querying the database. It's building the page and returning it. So the Q equal is all this, this query stuff that's going on. It's all the dynamic stuff that's happening is what's happening afterwards. And then we decided to take that one step further. We said, why restrict it to just node slash 11? Let's have it be slash phishing, you know, or whatever, whatever you want it to have. So we added another layer on top of that with the path module. Uh, and what we did is we just mapped those already clean URLs to more search engine friendly URLs or whatever URL you want to have on your site. I tend to think of, of Drupal sort of actually in like little layers, you know, so there's like this theme layer that sort of sits on top. Um, and that basically, you know, you're generating content and it's sitting in a database and you, it's all related to each other in Drupal's little world. But at the end of the day, it needs to be presented on a browser screen to your end user. So theming is Drupal's presentational layer. It's, it's the display layer, and it's, it's separated conceptually from Drupal's framework, the functionality layer. The idea of the Drupal theme layer is to separate logic from display. When the logic's all done, it's handed to the theme layer and says, okay, the logic's done, just print this out. And then the theme layer, that's when it decides exactly how that data is actually going to be output. There isn't processing done before it, it just kind of gets the, the data and knows what it needs to actually output. And then the theme function can actually decide, take that object and print it out in any way you like. It's really cool that you can have these things separated like that because it means that you can really quickly assemble the functionality of your site and then choose the look of your site separately. And these things are not interrelated. Also, you can have two different teams working on the site at the same time. 
uh, you can have people working on the functionality, uh, while meanwhile the design people are working on the, the, the theming aspect of things. Or you can download um, existing themes uh, and basically change the look of your site. Drupal has, has the ability to output things however you like. Um, it's got the basic node data, but the node data is not at all tied to how things are displayed. Um, things can be displayed however you want and not necessarily in HTML. Uh, you could output them, say, in, in uh, JSON for JavaScript, or you could output them in XML uh, for RSS feeds or for any format you wanted. You know, the theme layer is something that you can, uh, you can affect. Um, and you don't have to drill deep down into the guts of Drupal in order to change how something looks, um, which is really nice. Drupal has a lot of different ways of informing you of what's going on in your site, or if there's things that you ought to pay attention to, or if there's errors that happen and that kind of thing. Uh, the most obvious way is if you click and something bad happens, you'll get a little red error on the screen that you're looking at that says, for example, the username field is required uh, or something like that. Um, so that's an easy feedback way to know that, oops, I messed up and I did something wrong. Drupal has two main error reporting modes, uh, and that's essentially the difference between the two is the difference between your development uh, or your, your kind of working state and then your production final state. Uh, so the two, the two are, you know, whether you want to log all errors as well as uh, print them to the screen. So anytime, uh, you know, PHP runs into a parse error or there's a warning or things like that, uh, it will it will log that error to Drupal's using Drupal's logging system, uh, and then you can also have it printed to the screen. So as you're developing and working on your site, you can actually get those errors right there. So you don't have to go check the logs; they're they're there, and you can address them uh, in your code. Most people, in terms of the end user, you would really rather them just get a blank screen than have a whole bunch of nasty code and weird warnings and things that are sort of frightening and scary sounding. And they're like, oh my gosh, do I have a virus on my computer? I mean, they're just not sure. And so silence generally is sort of the best rule there. Um, so instead of actually having it printed out to the screen, you would rather just have it logged. Uh, there's also the, uh, the concept of a watchdog error logging message. Um, if you go under the administration panel in reports, you can see a whole log of all the system events that have happened, uh, which logs everything from really bad like database error, PHP error kind of stuff, um, but it also logs things like who's searching for what terms, and when was content created or deleted, and who did it, and, and so on, which is good to keep track of, especially if you have some kind, you know, you want to do some sort of security auditing kind of things, and, and also just to keep track of, you know, say pages that aren't found. There's a concept of a status report, and at any given time in your site, it will kind of keep track of uh, the state of the site and if there's anything that you need to be concerned about. So that keeps track of things like what version of PHP are you running, what version of MySQL are you running, when was the last time that cron ran, uh, when was uh, the last time that your system was checked for security updates, um, and it will also inform you there if there's a problem that you need to address. And so it's a good thing to just sort of go and check that every once in a while. It's just sort of like a little healthy little status report, like, is there anything odd going on with my site? Um, you know, not, it's not, obviously it's not going to cover every nook and cranny, but it's just sort of covering some of the, the big basic things about, about uh, where your site's running, how it's running, and, and what you may need to attend to that might just sort of silently be happening in the background that you're just sort of not aware of. So after you get Drupal installed, one of the first things that you have to do is set up what's called a cron job. And most people have no idea what that is, <laughs> and it is kind of a funny word. Um, what cron basically is, is it's something that runs on a schedule. And you can set up how often, like every five minutes or every hour, or every six days or something like that. 
on a given website, it's, it's often important for different tasks to be performed at regular intervals. Um, that could be um, updating a list of uh, what the highest rated content on the website is, or it could be clearing out old log information that's no longer necessary. Um, that's performed by um, a utility called Cron that works with Drupal. Um, it's a Unix utility that's present on lots of different web servers that can just, on at regular intervals, like say every 30 minutes or so, just run a particular command. Um, Drupal has a system that utilizes that um, cron software to execute cleanup tasks and um, perform different you know, tasks at regular intervals. Uh, we had this one client that didn't install or didn't run cron on their system and we asked them how many records they had in one of the tables in Drupal and they said they had over a million and it was the cache table which is supposed to hold all of this sort of temporary information that can be built up and lost and built up and lost you know to for, for performance and uh, you know as soon as we cleared that table for them the site was snappy and responsive and we were able to get cron up and running and their site was fine Cron is important because it does things like clean out your old log files and re-index your, your content for the search engine and, uh, you know, kind of general maintenance tasks that, that only makes sense to do once in a while. It'll send out emails on a certain schedule uh, so that you don't do things all at once and take on your site. It'll sort of batch things up and, and do them a lot over time. If you have search enabled, um, Drupal has to go through and actually see, oh, you've got new content, and oh, you've got new words in that content, and I need to know about that. Um, it doesn't do that, like, on the fly every single time, because that would be rather intensive. So, um, so Drupal does that on a cron run. Because Drupal is a database-driven application, a lot of times uh, people will kind of get nervous about the fact, like, well, is it going to scale? You know, like, a, a, just a static HTML page is really easy to serve, but when you start bringing databases and PHP and stuff like that, um, it, it becomes quite a bit of extra overhead. But there are things that you need to keep in mind as you're making the transition from tinkering around and building websites and learning how Drupal works to actually making one that can stand up under the load of, you know, being linked to by Slashdot or being mentioned in an article, you know, in a magazine or something like that. A lot of the performance and scalability with Drupal actually comes from the other layers. It comes from, you know, the operating system, the database, the web server, and Drupal is sort of the last thing that you optimize. Because you're gonna, if you can optimize Drupal all you want, but if you're, if you're reaching a bottleneck with the other layers that are coming before that, um, that's really going to, you know, you're not going to see the uh, performance increases that you would otherwise notice. Uh, we've helped set up a lot of, uh, you know, large scale clients with, you know, these 20 server uh, in installations where they've got multiple database servers and load balanced Apache servers and separate file servers and uh, and all that kind of stuff, you know, so each um, each of the different aspects of, of the web um, uh, website, you know, which might all run on one server if you're running it on the $5 a month hosting, uh, you know, can kind of break off and, and, and you can actually dedicate an entire server or, or, or uh, group of servers um, to that functionality. So it, it scales uh, pretty well. Drupal provides a lot of ways to improve the performance of your site and help it to scale. Um, at a basic level, some, some things that you can do are you can turn on uh, CSS ag aggregation. What that will do is take all of the various style files that are coming from different modules and themes in different places and smush them all down into one file. So that's only sent across the wire once. And that will make your site a lot more responsive for your visitors. Traditionally, the solution has been to rework the internals of Drupal so that it's easy to plug in new capabilities for, say, advanced caching or new ways of optimizing speed for certain kinds of information lookups or whatever, um, but not to require those so that people with modest hardware or small needs can just install Drupal out of the box and start using it, um, whereas people who really need to, sque need to squeeze performance out of it can begin optimizing and, and replacing certain components with um, with highly optimized replacements. The 
caching is a really important concept in Drupal and actually in a lot of websites. Um, the idea behind caching is that there are some kinds of content that can be really expensive to build from um, the perspective of a server that has to spend time pulling information out of the database and formatting in HTML and taking into account all of the information like who a user's friends are and what content they've recommended to that person and stuff like that. Um, it's not that bad on a simple website, but on complex websites that have lots of rich context and you know time-based information, there are certain pieces of information that just take a long time to build. And if you have a lot of traffic coming to your website, each person asking the web server to build that complex bit of information can be a serious problem. Um, caching is basically just the practice of only building that once if it doesn't need to be redone. So the HTML parts of Drupal, the HTML pages can't be cached because they're dynamic. You're always updating that. People are adding comments, you are creating new blog entries, you know, all that stuff lives in the database, not static files like those other parts. So what we've enabled inside Drupal is a page caching mechanism where if an anonymous user visits, visits a page, at the end of that request, we take all of that and stick it in the database. The next time an anonymous user visits that same page, we can say, you know what, nothing's changed yet. So let's just load, let's just load that page that we have on standby. And that's generally what is referred to as, as caching. It's slightly less desirable because it only works for anonymous users, not people who are logged in. And the other problem is that it, uh, it will make the content stale for a certain period of time. So for example, if there's new comments in the last five minutes, they might not see them except every time the cache flushes, which might be every 10 minutes or so. It's also possible to do smaller bite-sized chunks of a page and um, cache them as the, after they're built so that even um, logged in users who may see a different mix of content um, may still be seeing a cached piece of content or a smaller chunk of the page if it doesn't change very frequently. And what we've done is we've evolved from just a page caching system to a module caching system as well. So now different modules, if there's parts of their code that tend to be CPU intensive or a little more involved from an algorithm standpoint, de uh, developers can cache that now. They can create their own cache tables, store that information, and uh, you know just call on that rather than going through all of the all of the steps over and over again. There's also a um, relatively new feature called aggressive caching that strips out a lot of the API calls that Drupal will make to third-party modules to allow them to do their work and focus on doing nothing but pulling that cached page out of the database and presenting it to a user. That means that Drupal does a lot less work to display a page to a user and that means that your website can serve pages to more users as they come and visit the site. There's also modules such as memcache and advanced cache to do crazy kinds of caching, but generally you only need that if you're, you're talking about several different uh, you know, backends that you're, you're using. For the typical person who's just using a blog site or even just a really popular site you know, with not a lot of logged in users, you should be fine with the default options.